and welcome members uh, to today's meeting. I'm going to call the meeting of the state government finance and elections for February 2nd, 19 or 2021. Um, <clears throat> pursuant to House File 10.01, where this meeting is being held remotely. The legislative assistant, Ms. Spreck, and we'll take the roll. Chair Nelson? I'm here. Vice Chair Carlson? Here. Representative Nash? Present. Representative Bonner? Present. Representative Dreskowski? Representative Elkins? Present. Representative Greenman? Present. Representative Cleborn? Present. Representative Kosnick? Present. Representative Mason? Representative New Brindley? Present. Representative Pulowski? Present. Representative Kwong? Present. A quorum is present. Thank you, Ms. Sprick. Um, we have the approval of two minutes, um, two sets of minutes. Uh, the first set will be uh, um, from January 28th. Um, Representative Clayborn, did you get a chance to read the minutes? Yes, Mr. Chair, and I move that the minutes of uh, January 28th be approved as written. The motion has been made that the minutes for January 28th be approved as written. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. We also have the minutes from January 29th, 2021. Um, Ms. Clay, Representative Claybor, if you want to move those minutes also. Yes, Mr. Chair, I move that the minutes from January 29th be approved as written. Uh, the motion has been made for the to approve the minutes from January 29th. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes been approved. Thank you, uh, members. And this morning we have a couple of overviews and budget presentations from um, three departments that we have and under our purview. Uh, we're starting with the Department of Revenue. Um, Rep our Commissioner Doty, welcome to the committee. Um, please state your name for the, the record and you can proceed with your testimony. Uh, good morning, um, Chair Nelson, members of the committee. Thank you for having us here today. For the record, uh, my name is Robert Doty, and I'm the commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Revenue. With me today is Assistant Commissioner Alyssa Haugen. Alyssa oversees the department's administrative support areas, including financial management and budget. We are here today to give you an overview of the department and how we strive to meet our customers' needs through efficient and effective tax administration, our response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and information on our operating adjustment. Typically, we would invite the members of the committee to tour the department and learn about our operations. Instead of, the, instead of the tour, we have put a QR code on the title slide and the handout that opens to a video sharing the work we do at the department. And I encourage you to take a look at that video at your leisure. Next slide, please. Our mission is working together to fund Minnesota's future. Our vision is everyone reports, pays, and receives the right amount, no more, no less. Our work is to implement the tax code consistently and transparently to ensure fairness. We strive to do our work with integrity, respect, excellence, and accountability. Next slide. The individual income tax filing season is what most Minnesotans think of when they think of the Department of Revenue. But individual income taxes are just one of over 30 tax types the department is responsible for administering. We administer the well-known tax types like income, sales, corporate taxes, but also includes mineral, lawful gambling, tobacco, petroleum taxes, and even less well-known taxes like the farm winery tax or dry cleaner solvent fees or the, the solid waste management tax and many more. We work year round with our customers to help them understand and meet their obligations under the 48 separate tax laws in Minnesota's code. We work to make their interactions with the department as efficient as possible. Next slide, please. Our customers, we, we provide services to a variety of customers, including, for example, individuals, businesses, and counties. Each year, we serve about 2.9 million individual income tax filers from, 
from first time filers trying to figure out how to file and pay for the first time to people who use tax preparers and accountants to file. Some of these people will receive a refund while others will make a payment. We serve veterans, homeowners, renters, members of the military, seniors, people new to Minnesota, and many, many more. We serve all 87 Minnesota counties by overseeing the 800 licensed property tax assessors and the uniform application of property tax laws by local governments, administer state property tax refund and relief programs, processing over 850,000 property tax refunds per year, and make state aid payments to counties, cities, towns, and special taxing districts through 31 different state programs. We serve all types of businesses from Fortune 100 companies to startups and garages. Over 160,000 businesses collect, file, and pay sales tax every month. There are 415,000 businesses in e-services, our online file and pay system. Most of these businesses are located in Minnesota. Others are doing business here, but are located across the country and the world. Next slide, please. Now I will give you a brief update on how the Department of Revenue prepares for the income, file, income tax filing season. The process of preparing for the, in, the upcoming filing season is fairly consistent from year to year. At the department, we call this process annual changes. We begin when the legislative session ends in May by synthesizing law changes. We work to incorporate these changes into draft forms and we publish the near final forms in August. Throughout this process, we engage and communicate with our many stakeholders. We incorporate the feedback about our forms and instructions and make clarifications based on stakeholder questions. We publish the final forms in October. This year, individual income tax season will open on February 12th, which mirrors the timeline at the federal level. Next slide, please. As soon as our near final forms are published in August, the department identifies the systems requirements necessary to begin development. This is how we make the tax forms and software products communicate with our tax processing system. Gathering system requirements includes, but is not limited to, working with over 20 software providers regarding over 50 software products, creating paths between a tax return and the taxpayer's record, and setting parameters for fraud detection. Developers and programmers at the department and at system, excuse me, and at software provider companies begin building and testing the systems based on these requirements. Finally, we get, as we get close to the opening of the filing season, we start testing with the IRS to ensure our systems are compatible with the IRS system. All this work is vital to ensure that Minnesotans can file, pay, and receive their refunds in a timely manner. After all this work, we are excited for the filing season to start. Next slide. It is clear that the pandemic affected all aspects of our work and our volunteer income tax assistance or VITA sites are no exception. Typically, we help fund and promote over 200 VITA sites in Minnesota. VITA is a service for taxpayers who are 60 or older, have a disability, speak limited or no English, or have an annual income less than 55,000. The COVID-19 pandemic brought unique challenges to our VITA sites. In 2020, we shifted our in-person sites to virtual so we could continue to serve low-income Minnesotans in a safe environment. A list of in-person and virtual VITA sites will be on our website this month once filing season is open and the sites have completed their certification. We learned a lot during the 2020 filing season, and we are confident we can meet these challenges, we can meet any challenges the 2021 filing season may bring. Next slide, please. Adjusting VITA services is not the only way the Department of Revenue responded to the pandemic. We quickly got to work listening to our customers and providing them relief while also balancing the needs of state and local governments. The Department of Revenue provided taxpayer relief within a number of different tax types. Our employees carried out new projects to address the needs of the state. The Minnesota Department of Revenue has 1,400 employees across 19 divisions and offices in St. Paul and across the state. Nearly all employees have been working from home since the governor's stay-at-home order began on May 27th. Our partners at the Minnesota IT Services quickly supplied needed technology to support this effort. About 80 employees are required to be 
physically at their work location in order to perform their job. These employees are maintaining proper social distancing and other public health measures while at work. Our St. Paul lobby will open to the public next week to provide limited in-person services to support the filing season. And we have been providing a self-service station with request forms, pens, and envelopes. Using this station, customers can ask us to mail forms and instructions, request additional tax information, order copies of previous state tax returns, and submit state tax returns or payments. Department employees are continuing to answer phone calls, emails, and mail, and process returns and other filings. We have also been working with members of the legislature to address constituent issues and provide information and revenue estimates as you continue your, legisl your legislative work. Whether working in an office or remotely, the same high standards for protecting customer information are still in place. Next slide. We know that ready access to information and transparency for the public are important. We are continually updating our COVID-19 website with additional information to respond to taxpayer questions. We have FAQs, the most up-to-date information on tax deadlines, abatement information, and we also link to IRS resources, specifically those on the federal economic stimulus payments. Our website became the best way to communicate all these COVID-19 related changes. Taxpayers, preparers, and members of the public can also sign up for our Gov delivery um, email list to get updates sent, sent right to their inbox. We have nearly 400,000 unique subscribers and it is really the best way for us to communicate directly with our customers. It is clear that the pandemic of, uh, excuse me, <laughs> uh, next slide please. Um, and with that, Mr. Chair, I'm now going to turn it turn over to Assistant Commissioner Alyssa Haugen to present the Department of Revenue's budget request. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Alyssa Haugen, Assistant Commissioner. Uh, next slide, please. So as the commissioner mentioned, the Department of Revenue currently has about 1,400 employees that work throughout the state of Minnesota. As you can see here, of our $170 million budget, about 92% of that is for our employee and IT costs. Next slide, please. The governor's recommendation that we are presenting today reflects the funding necessary to sustain our current operations and our agency commitment to identifying efficiencies to manage ongoing cost growth related to compensation, IT services, and other agency operating expenses. The governor is recommending a one-time reduction of $8.274 million returning to the fiscal year 21 general fund operating appropriation due to the efficiencies that we've realized during this last fiscal year. In addition, the governor recommends additional funding of $3.956 million in fiscal year 22 and $6.828 million in fiscal year 23 to maintain the current level of service delivery at the Department of Revenue. This operating adjustment will partially cover known employee compensation growth and allow the department to maintain its existing level of information technology services. Each year, the cost of doing business rises. Our employer paid health care contributions, FICA and Medicare, along with other salary and compensation related costs increase. Absorbing this increase within existing agency base appropriations results in reduced staffing or reduced non-compensation spending. Based on the department's existing staffing and previously negotiated and upcoming contract negotiations, our compensation costs are expected to increase 4% per year over the next biennium. These increases cannot be avoided. Our other agency operating costs like rent, fuel and utilities, printing and mail, legal services, and rates for IT services also continue to grow. This funding is necessary to sustain our current operations because of increased customer demand, the significant work related to the difference between federal and state tax law, and the need to protect the revenue stream for the state. If there are changes made to Minnesota's tax code during legislative session, we will need to request additional administrative funding to ensure the department can update our tax forms, our internal systems, and to prepare taxpayers for new or significant changes to the tax code. Next slide, please. One of the most important things that we do at the department is data security. 
We take our responsibility of protecting tax information very seriously. Our tax system works because Minnesotans trust their information is secure. While using technology is important for the convenience of our customer, it's also important for the security of their information. The Department of Revenue, in partnership with Minnesota IT Services, protects taxpayer data by blending the use of industry and regulatory security controls and standards. The Center for Internet Security, the SANS Institute, IRS Safeguards, and Minute Services Enterprise Security Office are the organizations and regulatory bodies that establish these security controls and standards. Our strong commitment and success in information and data security also protects our access to federal tax information. Through our partnership with the IRS, we can access federal tax information, which is critical to efficiently administering the state's tax system. Employees teleworking have a responsibility to protect state data by following cybersecurity best practices. This includes multi-factor authentication to access department data and a virtual private network that encrypts data to allow employees to access network resources when they are not at their primary work location. Staff also receive annual security training and ongoing awareness campaigns, including brown bag sessions, newsletters, and emails to keep security awareness top of mind. In addition, the department works with Minute to identify identity theft and ensure taxpayer information is secure and protected. Scams targeted at taxpayers continue to increase, including sending emails, text messages, and calling over the phone to fish for information tricking taxpayers into giving criminals personal information needed to commit identity theft crimes, such as filing false tax returns. This operating adjustment will ensure adequate funding so the department can maintain our existing level of information technology services and the necessary data and cybersecurity protections to keep Minnesotans tax-related information secure. Next slide, please. At the department, one of our agency strategies is to create operational efficiencies and leverage technology to meet customer and employee needs. Our ongoing commitment to identifying efficiencies has been demonstrated by the department's past efforts to develop an integrated tax system, enhance our online business filing and payment options, create virtual audit document sharing options, and consolidating our lease space. These efficiencies allow us to focus on our fraud detection and prevention efforts, improve our customer service, and maintain the staffing levels that are necessary to collect state and other agency debt. Throughout this past fiscal year, the department realized one-time operating efficiencies related to our pandemic response, and the reduction amount in this proposal reflects the savings generated due to the state hiring freeze, due to our efforts maximizing our virtual interactions with our customers, which reduced our use of fleet vehicles and other travel costs for our compliance work, and the reduced use of paper and other office supplies due to the current virtual work environment. It also reflects salary savings due to salary savings leave and redeployments, which allowed us to maximize these one-time compensation savings. The Department of Revenue will continue pursuing operational efficiencies in fiscal year 22 and 23 and beyond the next biennium. Some of the efforts that we're focusing on include identifying options for reducing our mailing and printing costs. In fiscal year 20, the department sent over 3 million pieces of mail to Minnesotans to help them meet their tax obligations. As mailing costs continue to increase, our statutory obligation to mail hard copies to our customers create significant budget pressure for the department. So we'll be working to identify and realize ways to reduce these printing and mailing costs and send documents to customers in a secure electronic fashion. In the next biennium, we will also be focusing on establishing a permanent virtual workforce model by transitioning some of our current regional office locations to a virtual home-based workspace. This will allow the department to maintain a presence in communities throughout the state expand our future ability to recruit, recruit employees located anywhere in Minnesota while reducing our costs for renting physical office locations. Next slide, please. Those who file and pay Minnesota taxes need to be able to trust the system that receives their personal information, know that other taxpayers are paying their fair share, and that they will receive the right refund in a reasonable amount of time. Increased operational costs limit our ability to provide the level of service our customers need and expect, and without additional resources, service delivery erodes. For the Department of Revenue, 
This means that customers will wait longer for income and property tax refunds and have a harder time reaching someone in the department by phone or email to have their questions answered. In addition, we will be able to perform fewer educational classes and audits to help Minnesotans meet their tax obligations and there will be less support available for low-income taxpayers who are not represented by tax professionals, including lawyers, CPAs, and tax preparers. Increased costs will also negatively impact the revenue stream that supports state and local governments, as revenue collects nearly $27 billion for the state's general fund and about $450 million in local option sales tax. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members, so much for allowing us to present to you today. At this time, we can take your questions. Jimmy. Chair Nelson, you're muted. Come on. Sorry about that. I have Representative Kosnick on the list and, re and then Representative Nash. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I was encouraged to hear in your message or, or the um, the mission of the department that nobody pays any extra, nobody pays any less. Uh, one of the components of the governor's budget uh, has to do with the earned income family tax credit. And from my uh, four years on the tax committee, uh, I remember one of the um, concerns about that program was the level of fraud. Um, what has the department done to mitigate uh, some of that um, fraud and making sure that the people that uh, claim that credit are actually uh, deserving of it and qualify for it. Um, and some of it, uh, the fraud may not have been necessarily intentional. Uh, divorced families, different, uh, maybe the mom and the dad claiming the credit. Uh, can you speak to us about uh, your mitigation efforts to reduce the fraud in that program uh, relative to the budget proposal? Uh, Commissioner Doty or Ms. Hagen, Haugen, um, which one do you want to jump um, on that? Uh, I'll, um, uh, Chair, uh, I'll, take a, I'll take a stab at that. <laughs> Commissioner Doty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and um, uh, uh, committee. Um, with regard to the, uh, uh, the working family credit um, and, um, and the is any, any issues related to fraud, um, a couple things that I will say, um, I, I don't have specific details about, about some of the um, IT related ways that we um, continue to work to mitigate um, fraud, but a couple things that I will say. One is that we work, uh, the, the working family credit is directly related to the federal earned income credit. And so a lot of the fraud mitigation strategies that the IRS has in place, um, we specifically rely on that, um, those strategies, and we continue to, uh, to work to um, uh, do our own our own, our, excuse me, our own um, mitigation uh, processes as well. So we're verifying information um, for taxpayers. We like, you know, we were verifying, we're verifying social security numbers. We're doing some of those types of things specifically in addition to what the uh, um, the feds are doing as well. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I had another question. Um, maybe the commissioner can talk about it or I'll turn it over to other committee members um, if they wanted to talk about the um, federal conformity to the PPP loans um, and how we're going to potentially address that, why that was overlooked even going into the budget cycle. But maybe another member has a question. If uh, well, well, Representative, Representative Kosnick, that's more of a tax um, committee question. We're here for the administration piece of it then. Um, so, Representative Nash, you're next on the list. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the presenters. Um, well, it always warms my heart when you actually, in your presentation, talk about cybersecurity. That makes me very happy. Uh, I'm pleased to hear that you've gone to the extent that you have to make sure that uh, the information that you manage is, is secure. Uh, but I wanted to go to the question relative to uh, the one-time reduction and then the new funding. Uh, I asked this of, of every presenter with a budget request. Um, so you, you're, you're gonna ask for the 8.274 million reduction. Um, 
can you tell us how you possibly would uh, maintain that moving forward? Because, you know, again, we don't know what the, the forecast is going to look like. We don't know uh, how things will go in the Senate as a mysterious body as it is. And I think that it's, uh, it's a good question for everyone to be prepared to answer and have an answer for uh, as to how you're going to look for savings uh, maybe in rents or in uh, other ways to trim budgets as you move forward through this uh, upcoming biennium, because quite honestly, families are suffering. They're tightening their belts, and I'm, I'm asking uh, all presenters to do the same. So if you could maybe walk through uh, how you're going to manage the, uh, the almost uh, eight and, uh, 8.27 million and how you could possibly make that sustainable. Thank you. Commissioner Doty. Um, Chair, members of the committee, I would uh, ask that um, Alyssa Haugen take a stab at, at responding to that, if she would. Ms. Haugen. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, Representative Nash, thank you. The department is uh, committed to maximizing our operational efficiencies. As we mentioned in the upcoming biennium, we will be focusing on transitions in some of our regional office locations to a permanent virtual workforce model uh, so that we can start to reduce uh, some of those costs. Uh, but as I mentioned at the beginning, over 92% of our $170 million budget is for employee in IT costs alone. And so to manage that type of a reduction ongoing, uh, we will not be able to sustain that without affecting our employee uh, complement and those vacancies result in uh, eroding service delivery. We will not be able to respond as timely to constituents and we will experience service delays. Our plan moving forward is to continue as the state is in this hiring freeze. Uh, we review every vacancy and are only filling those that are critical, uh, but over time uh, that significantly impacts our ability to provide service to Minnesotans, especially as the compensation costs continue to increase. Thank you. Representative Nash. That's all for now. Thank you. I'll Next, I have the Representative Greenman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and I really appreciate the presentation. I'm wondering, um, and I want to go back a bit to um, uh, uh, the work you said about the Working uh, Families Tax Credit and the audits and the additional protections. In this pandemic, I think we've seen um, that the K-shaped recovery and really how many corporations are doing better and better. And I'm wondering um, what, if, if, if there's the same level of, of auditing and emphasis on corporate tax returns, uh, which are sometimes, uh, which are often more complicated. And, I, um, uh, and so I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, the additional uh, 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 audits and other um, emphasis on making sure that we are having accurate and uh, that corporations are paying their fair share. Uh, Commissioner Doty or Ms. Haugen? Um, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, committee, uh, that's a great question. Um, we have a pretty uh, uh, robust um, audit process that's already, that is already in place um, for, um, for, corporate, for corporate reviews. And, um, and again, um, you know, I, I can't go into the details of exactly all the pieces that we that we how that audit though that our audit process specifically works. But what I, I will tell you is that um, uh, we have uh, a multi multi step kind of an audit process that has been in place pre pandemic, um, and um, and just like with everything, the pandemic has has forced us to to re examine some of that and to uh, to look closely at. At exactly um, um, what we're doing within with each of our taxpayers, whether that be on the individual side or on the corporate side. So um, again, uh, we are we are looking at at our corporate audit and our corporate audit process uh, very closely um, right now, specifically. Representative Greenman. Thank you, uh, and I appreciate that. As a uh, former private practice lawyer, I know that um, in a lot of cases, corporations with, with really complex tax returns oftentimes um, think about their tax returns as sort of an opening uh, uh, bid. And so I just I'm, I really hope that uh, and and appreciate the work you're doing because I think it is critical to uh, to the state and to making sure that folks pay their fair share. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Mason. You're still muted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Since most of your uh, funding 
has to do with your staff. I'm making the assumption that dealing with COVID right now, you are actually not, you don't need as much staff as previously. Because that was my question. Is it making it more difficult uh, for you to maintain your services? Or if you're actually taking, uh, as I said, you're decreasing, that means you're letting go people. And I'm trying to figure out how that makes it easier to serve people. And then the other question, and I think you started answering it, is like how, mu how much of your staff is actually doing like investigating or auditing? And is that being made more, how, you know, how does, how are you dealing with that right now as well? Thank you. Commissioner. Um, Mr. Chair, um, committee, um, that's another one I'm gonna turn over to Assistant Commissioner Haugen to, to address that. <laughs> Ms. Haugen. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, we are constantly balancing the needs for customer service, education and outreach and auditing. In the current virtual environment, uh, we are maximizing all of the interactions that we can uh, using the virtual tools to interact uh, with our taxpayers and making sure that we're still available uh, via phone and email. As far as how uh, we are managing with the current staff complement, we are managing through attrition. So as uh, vacancies arise, uh, we are making sure that we have that balance of audit, customer service, uh, and outreach, and then only filling those critical vacancies uh, given the current budget pressure that's facing the agency and the state. Representative Mason. Okay, just, I do know that there are people that don't have computers, and that is, a main concern uh, where it looks like we're trying to go to doing a lot online. So I know you did mention that you are still using telephones, so that is still adequate for most people if they can't come into the uh, building. Thank you. Uh, next I have a represent Representative Draskowski. Welcome to the committee and um, glad you're able to make it this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, um, Commissioner Doty and, and uh, Assistant uh, Deputy or Assistant Commissioner Haugen. Thank you for your presentations. Um, you know, over the last 10 years, uh, one, of, one of my observations has been in, in many of our agencies and certainly in your agency, it's very true that technology has promised to reduce the cost of staff all along. And we've been told that every biennium when we go through exercises like the one we're going through here today. Um, and I'm curious, you know, you've got in your department, uh, the third party uh, tax filing companies, uh, and you've got, uh, you know, instead of, uh, instead of hard copy forms that need to be handled by staff, you've got certificate of rents paid now that are, are uh, or I should say it correctly, certificates of rent paid uh, that are, um, are handled electronically largely now rather than by paper. Uh, we would expect, and we certainly were sold when this technology came by your agency and others, we were going to see significant decreases in costs due to staff because of these electronic efficiencies. Can you tell us how many FTEs you have shed because of these efficiencies in your department in the last 10 years? Ms. Haugen, Representative uh, Commissioner Doty. Uh, Chair, uh, committee, I'm going to turn that to um, Assistant Commissioner Haugen. <laughs> Ms. Haugen, I got, I got it right that time. You asked for <laughs> Ms. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, thank you. I do not uh, have that FTE count for your representative. What I can tell you is that uh, the department is continually maximizing uh, those efficiencies. And at this point in time, we are looking for uh, the savings that we can realize, as I mentioned, of reducing our printing uh, and mailing costs because of the significant cost that presents the department and how we can uh, leverage our staff to make sure that they're available to ask those technical and challenging taxpayer questions and educate our taxpayers to make sure that all Minnesotans have an opportunity to meet their obligations under the tax code. Thank you, so Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Haugen, have you had any cuts in FTEs due to these efficiencies? Ms. Haugen. 
Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I would need to uh, look into the historical uh, rollout of that system. What I do know is it allowed us to reduce uh, the amount and varied systems that we had in place at the department, which having one single system to maintain allows us to better serve our customers and to share information across the department and with other agencies as necessary in a more efficient manner. Representative Skowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Haugen. Uh, mm -hmm. Members, uh, mm -hmm. as we look at government agencies, uh, I would suspect and expect that, uh, that agencies that had FTE cuts uh, due to these efficiencies would remember them. And uh, this one doesn't. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Claver, and you'll get the last question and we can, so we can move on to our next presenter. Uh, Representative Claiborne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and this is just uh, maybe Ms. Haugen, you can answer this question. Um, I remember hearing the Secretary of State saying that during the pandemic, we have had more people open new businesses as opposed uh, because they've left their corporate jobs and they've opened their own uh, either single shingle uh, businesses or started new ventures. Uh, how does the department work with the Secretary of State to make sure that we are capturing those new businesses? And I would think that would actually create more work for your department, but could you just say a little bit about that? Ms. Haugen. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, we do partner with a variety of state partners. I am not uh, familiar with our relationship specifically with the Secretary of State, but we do work across the enterprise uh, to make sure that we maximize the opportunities to share necessary information uh, for the work that we do, as well as for the work that our partner agencies do in the enterprise. Representative Claiborne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering if it's increased their workload um, during this pandemic period of time with these new businesses being opened. Thank you. Uh, and and Represent Commissioner Doty and Ms. Hogan, thank you for your presentation. And uh, um, hopefully when, our, when we get our targets and our budget and we get it, we'll be able to uh, do what we have to do and that you'll, hopefully you'll be happy with what you get. Um, with that, um, next we're gonna move on to the Department of Administration and uh, Commissioner Robert Roberts Davis. Um, welcome to the committee, please. Uh, State your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. I guess I was muted, um, Ms. Davis, yes. Yeah. Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much for the record. I am Alice Roberts Davis, Commissioner of the Department of Administration. I appreciate the invitation to provide a brief introduction to the Department of Admin, uh, the work of our 450 team members and the diverse service offerings of our 25 business divisions. Admin has a wide ranging set of responsibilities that ultimately touch every part of state government. Because of our varied roles across the enterprise, admin has a unique opportunity to meet our vision of delivering excellence. We foster a culture of change and ensure that diversity, equity and inclusion are at the core of how state government operates and develops policy. Our duty is to help government best serve Minnesotans. We are a central service agency, meaning that in large part, our partners and customers are other state agencies. We also serve the governor, the legislature, local municipalities and nonprofit organizations. And we do to a lesser extent provide services directly to Minnesotans. Our work is primarily behind the scenes business functions that provide the administrative backbone for public agencies and direct services to residents. Just so you can get an idea of the size and scope of our work, here are a few statistics about admin. Our partners that are internal to state government rely on us to provide the critical core services that help keep them operating efficiently. These services include overseeing the state's annual purchasing of $3 billion in goods and services. We manage 6,200 state-owned buildings, 850 property leases, and more than 2,800 or 2,280 annual construction projects. We also manage a fleet of more than of more than 2,000 vehicles and 19.2 billion dollars of insured state assets. 
This unique relationship with our partners and expertise with key enterprise services allowed admin to play a key role in the state's pandemic response. I, along with Assistant Commissioner Aaron Campbell, and at least 15 other team members from the department have been redeployed to work full-time on response efforts. That actual number and the actual team members have fluctuated since March, but that is an addition to our normal workload and that has not yielded. The entire team has stepped up to contribute and I am so proud of each and every person here. Admin's total budget is a mix of legislatively appropriated general fund, enterprise service and special revenue funds, and federal grants. The general fund operating budget is dispersed across 13 divisions. The general fund makes up about 13% of admin's budget, but I wanna call out that that is somewhat misleading as half of that is legislatively appropriated pass-through funds, such as in lieu of rent and grant funding to public television and radio stations. It also includes two open forecasted appropriations, one for grants for historic preservation projects through the State Historic Preservation Office, and one to cover workers' compensation reinsurance premiums. Our actual general, general fund operating budget is only 6.5% of admin's total budget, or $28.1 million. Although small, it's a critical component to providing the breadth and quality of our enterprise services. I'd now like to give you a high-level overview of the admin divisions. We do a lot with a little. So specifically, what is it that we do? I mentioned that we have 25 unique divisions, so I'll try not to laundry list it. But if we were meeting in person today, you would see our facilities maintenance crews who keep the Minnesota Senate building, state capitol, and other capitol complex buildings operating and clean. They are our most visible service, but there's a lot more that we do that is not as public facing. Admin manages, constructs, and leases property for state government. Facilities management maintains and operates 23 state-owned buildings, including the state capitol, plus 32 parking facilities, 25 monuments, and associated grounds for a total of 4.4 million square feet. The division also coordinates events on the Capitol Complex and oversees the administration of Minnesota's bookstore, the State Register, and Central Mail. Our Real Estate and Construction Services Division manages over 280 construction projects and 850 property leases annually. Overall, the state has a real property footprint that includes 6,200 buildings and gross square feet and acreage equaling about 5.5% of the state and provides comprehensive leasing services to state agencies seeking state-owned and non-state-owned real estate for lease. The Enterprise Real Property Division coordinates 19 state agencies that have responsibility for managing real property. The governance structure for this division was formed to provide a transparent, collaborative, and uniform methodology for assessing the condition of state facilities. We manage the state's fleet equipment and insurance. Fleet services leases vehicles to state agencies for official state business. Div Division's lease program manages vehicle acquisition and disposition, fueling, maintenance, auto insurance, and life cycle management for roughly 2,000 vehicles. Surplus services assist with the redistribution, reuse, and disposal of state and federal surplus property. The division also operates the state auction program, which sells surplus property to the public by a live and online auctions. The risk management division operates Minnesota state government's insurance program, state workers' compensation and safety programs. We provide safety, loss control, risk, and insurance management consulting services to state agencies and actively work to get people back to work sooner and control costs through the MinState initiative. We provide enterprise services. The Small Agency Resource Team, or SMART, provides accounting, budgeting, and human resource services to the state's small agencies, boards, and councils. This central service model allows these entities to save money and focus on their missions. The Office of Enterprise Sustainability works with cabinet level agencies to meet goals and reduction of energy use, waste reduction, water use, fleet utilization, procurement, and greenhouse gas emissions so that the state may be a leader in sustainable practices. Our continuous improvement team provides project leadership, training, and improvement tools to all cabinet level state agencies and the Office of Collaboration and Dispute Resolution uses collaborative processes and the science of human relations to help government and stakeholders improve relationship, build trust, and develop wise and durable solutions to seemingly intractable issues. 
we manage the state's public contracting. The Office of State Procurement oversees $3.1 billion in goods and services purchases annually. The division negotiates volume discounts and passes along the savings to state agencies and local units of government through 1,600 enterprise contracts and the two largest multi-state cooperative purchasing programs in the nation. Their colleagues in the Office of Equity and Procurement ensure greater equity in state contracting and construction. It promotes opportunities to do business with the state and provides assistance to small business owned by women, minorities, people with physical disabilities, and veterans as they seek contracts. In 2020, we successfully increased state purchasing to $120 million with the targeted group businesses. Procurement Technical Assistance Center, or PTAC, provides assistance to all Minnesota businesses interested in selling their products and services to local, state, or federal government. This team helps match Minnesota businesses with government contracting opportunities. The Minnesota PTAC is nationally recognized as a top program and is funded in part by the U.S. Defense Logistics Agency. Community services are our more public-facing entities. The State Demographic Center analyzes and interprets demographic data and shares it with the public. They are also Minnesota's official liaison with the U.S. Census Bureau for the 2020 Census. Their work helped Minnesota achieve a 75.1% self-response rate, which was the top in the nation. The state archaeologists assist state agencies and other government entities, archaeology professionals, students, and the general public with the archaeological site protection, education, and research. The State Historic Preservation Office, or SHPO, leads the state's historic preservation initiatives, and they work closely with federal and tribal governments on preservation efforts. The Governor's Council on, Dis on Developmental Disabilities works to assure that persons with developmental disabilities receive the support they need to gain independence and integration into the community. The STAR program helps all Minnesotans with disabilities gain access to the assistive technology they need to live, learn, work, and play, and is federally funded by the Department of Health and Human Services. The Office of Grants Management works in partnership with more than 30 state agencies and organizations to standardize, streamline, and improve state grant making practices and increase access to grant opportunities. And the Data Practices Office is a statewide resource on Minnesota's open meeting law in the Data Practices Act. As you can see, we are very busy. Now I'll move on to admins change items in the governor's COVID-19 recovery budget. As a reminder, admins general fund operating budget is only six and a half percent of our total budget or $28.1 million. The first change item is in lieu of rent. The governor recommends additional funding of $624,000 in FY 2022 and sub each subsequent year from the general fund for in lieu of rent or ILR. ILR covers costs associated with operations around the capital for entities that do not directly pay for their lease spaces. This includes house, senate, and ceremonial, ceremonial spaces in the capital, as well as space for veteran services organizations, monuments, memorials, and the governor's residence. ILR helps ensure maintenance levels to properly maintain the restored capital, as well as the state office building. ILR is the only available source of funding for maintenance and operation of these spaces. Next, the governor recommends temporarily relieving the state parking fund of a statutory requirement to make certain transfers to the governor's, or, sorry, to the general fund. This will reduce transfers to the general fund by $993,000 in FY21 and 22. To relieve a shortfall in the user finance state parking fund, this proposed uh, temporarily suspends transfers from the parking fund to the general fund. The parking fund shortfall is the result of parking contract cancellations and decreased use of state meters as a consequence of the pandemic. This along with other initiatives will help ensure that parking is able to meet its obligations and provide safe, convenient parking for all users and is not unlike what other um, parking facilities are experiencing. Next, the governor recommends a reduction of $300,000 to the FY21 general fund operating appropriation, an additional fund of $335,000 in FY22, and $561,000 in each subsequent year from the general fund. 
The reduction reflects the savings generated due to the state hiring freeze and other operating efficiencies in the current year. The funding increase will support maintaining the current level of service delivery at the Department of Administration. This increase is below the assumed level of inflation, acknowledging continued efficiencies achieved by admin. And for admin, this modest 1.8% increase will help fund compensation for the existing workforce and other expenses such as rent and IT. Next, the governor recommends additional funding for admin on behalf of the entire enterprise for $5 million from the general fund in FY21 to complete and implement a comprehensive strategic plan for locating state agencies and for agency space consolidation and relocation. This funding is to complete and implement a comprehensive strategic plan for locating state agencies and to support agency space consolidation and relocation. Agencies are considering what their physical workspaces will look like in the future as they prepare for the post-pandemic workforce. Appropriate planning will allow for a strategic and coordinated approach through the assessment of current and projected needs. This plan would update strategies for ownership and leasing, transportation management, co-location of agencies, and space sharing for employees within agencies. Providing funds for agencies to downsize their space will allow them the flexibility to make their best choices for the state and the citizens they serve. Statute requires a regular update to the real estate strategic plan, but due to lack of funding, the last one was completed in 1993. So not only are we out of compliance with the statute, but the timing for this work is right, and we believe it would yield very important information that would lead to enterprise efficiencies and savings. And finally, the governor recommends a budget neutral policy to enhance state grant administration with no new funds proposed. The initiative allows state agencies to retain for grant administration up to 5% of grants funds for a new legislatively named grants and up to 10% for new competitively awarded grants. The change would ensure that all new grants have the minimal funds available to provide an appropriate level of service for grantees and protect the state's investment in the grant by ensuring compliance with state law and policies. This would not apply to current grants, only new grants and appropriated, uh, only new grants appropriated by the legislature, excuse me. That completes my overview of the department and our proposed budget changes. I appreciate your time and I will stand for any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. Our first person on my list is Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Commissioner, for being here this morning. Um, so I'll, I'm going to start off with the question that I ask everybody. So I'm, I'm sure you've been watching the, the question is doing more with less. Uh, I know that you talk about how many things that your agency is doing, and it certainly seems to have a fairly wide footprint. Um, but the practical reality is we're going to have to wind up looking at doing more with less. And are you prepared to, to do so? Do you have a plan to do so? Not just, oh, we'll figure it out when we get to it, if it happens, but have you begun contingency planning to reduce employees, shed space, um, find ways to, to squeeze the washcloth a little bit more to make sure that the taxpayers, um, wallet is is protected and, and mr chair I, I will have at least uh one more question for sure thank you representative uh, commissioner uh mr chair representative nash uh admin is the home of continuous improvement i did not mention that in my remarks but we also foster a culture of continuous improvement and we are constantly looking for efficiencies and we have gone through an exercise of looking at how we might reduce uh, costs within our agency uh, because we are always uh, trying to look for efficiency. And uh, the reality is, is the only way that we can really achieve efficiencies at this point would be looking at um, positions and uh, layoffs within our agency. And we're already in a position where we're stretched very thin uh, especially now during uh, pandemic response, our agency has really stepped up uh, with redeployments. People have uh, worked exceptionally hard. Um, I don't know any other way that we would be able to meet uh, a reduction, especially on the very small general fund budget that we have. 
other than laying off a portion of our team. And I think that that would disproportionately impact this, but this agency because of our small budget and uh, working with so little. Representative Nash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess I'm a little disheartened with the with a, a group that is apparently committed to continuous improvement saying uh, before we even see the budget, well, we don't know how we would do more with less or do things differently. But um, so the last time, Commissioner, you and I saw each other, we were at the state owned morgue um, sometime last year. And that is a fairly high profile acquisition by the state. Um, millions of dollars purchased building for uh, a warehouse. Uh, for those not familiar with it, it's a refrigerated grocery warehouse that uh, the decision was made by the Walls administration to turn into a morgue uh, were it to be needed. Obviously and gratefully, uh, we didn't need that from almost the onset. But uh, when I was there with you, Commissioner, it was filled with piles and piles of PPE. So my question is, one, uh, what are we doing to shed this building? Uh, or if it's not being shed, what are you doing with it? And then what are you doing with the uh, PPE that is in it? Because I know that people are still looking for PPE. And I'll roll in this as a bonus question so I don't have to come back because Mr. Chair is looking like he wants to move on to some other questioners. Uh, help us understand also the fence around the Capitol. So multiple part question that I'd appreciate answers specifically on all of them. Thank you. Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Nash, um, the last time we met, we were at the 1415 building. At that point in time, it was being used for storage. Uh, it continues to be used as storage for PPE. There was a point in time where we did think that we were going to have to mobilize and activate that building in uh, November, which was unfortunate. We did come to a peak point where we uh, did a lot of work in that building to prepare it because we, we did think that we were going to need it. Unfortunately, I'm so grateful that we did not. Since the last time you and I spoke, uh, we have worked with the feds to gain a $4.1 million reimbursement for that building. Uh, it did qualify for federal funding. Uh, so the state paid, I believe, $5.4 million, received $4.1 million from the feds uh, for it. We will continue to use it for storage throughout the pandemic until we receive word from the Department of Health that there is no, uh, no chance that it will be needed for uh, storage of human remains, at which point we will make a decision on whether we need it for warehouse space for the state or whether we'd like to um, in some way dispose of it as surplus property. Um, as we spoke about when we were there, it is a fairly rare find in this region, a refrigerated building of that sort. And so we do think that the building could actually be profitable to the state if we if we choose to sell it at the end of the pandemic. Um, so I believe that that touched on the answer to your questions about the 1415 cold storage building. Uh, your question about the fence is how long will the fence be there? Um, I think that uh, like, like everyone, uh, we all agree that the optics of the fence are not what we would prefer. We would prefer that it not be there. But at the same time, we know that there are um, a lot of dangers in having a, a more than $600 million building that uh, is open to incendiary devices, graffiti, um, all sorts of different uh, types of menaces that people are are uh, perpetrating at this particular point in time. And so the, the safe thing to do would be to maintain the fence until we feel that there is not a threat that somebody will actually damage the, the Capitol building. And so working with the Department of Public Safety and working with the Capitol Security and uh, working with the uh, different committees that have been put in place, working with the Lieutenant Governor, we'll come up with the decision on when the right time is to remove the fence so that we can uh, return things to normal on the Capitol complex. And Mr. Chair. Representative Nash. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. So, Commissioner, uh, I serve on the Capital Area Security Committee, and are you saying that if we deem the fence is, a, is an appropriate time to come down, that you're going to respond to that appropriately? Uh, second question, uh, relative to the state-owned morgue, um, when we were there, you and uh, your folks that toured us through did detail to us that uh, the roof needed to be repaired or replaced. Uh, I believe you estimated the cost at the time to be in excess of a million dollars. Uh, do you have an update for us on that? Because, you know, while federal dollars has been used for uh, some of the, the acquisition in, in uh, a backfill position, uh, you're still paying to maintain the building. You're still paying to staff the building. You're still paying uh, for a number of things uh, that the building will do, not for its intended purpose. And uh, mind you, I'm grateful that we don't have to use it for what the governor thought he needed to purchase it for. But uh, you do need to fix the roof if you're ever going to sell it. And you need to fix the roof if you're going to keep things in there that don't react so well to water. So please detail that as well. Commissioner. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Nash, the Department of Administration is uh, consulting with the Department of Public Safety and uh, with the committee that you are a member of. Uh, we put up the fence at the uh, request of the public Department of Public Safety uh, and the committee, and so we're acting collectively. We won't be the decision maker on when the fence comes down. It'll be a collective decision on when the timing is right for the fence to come down. And so um, we'll be waiting for that collective decision to be made. Um, so when that decision is made, that's when the fence will come down. As it relates to the roof, yes, there is still a need for a roof on the cold storage building. That has not yet happened. Um, there is not a staff at the 1415 building, as far as I'm aware. So there is not a, a expense related to that. Um, we do maintain the building, of course. There is some minimal charge for ensuring that it that the building pipes don't freeze and that it's uh, minimally maintained. But those are the only expenses that I'm aware of associated with that building. Uh, Representative Nash, if you're done, yeah, I'll thank move you, on. Yep, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Carlson. Thank and you, remember Mr. we have and remember we have another present a budget presentation to get through today too. So thank you, Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the reminder. Uh, I will be brief. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, good you morning. Mentioned, good morning. Yes. Um, in your uh, PowerPoint presentation, you mentioned that um, your procurement division um, is a recognized as a leader in public sector procurement uh, and has won some awards. So I want to draw attention to that. Uh, that's no small thing, uh, purchasing more than $2 billion worth of goods and services every year. Uh, so congratulations, that's that's wonderful. Um, keep up- Three the billion. Three, Three billion. billion. Oh, it keeps, keeps yeah. getting better. <laughs> um, and my question for you, and, and we, you may recall we had a, a conversation about this maybe a, a year ago, is can you describe some of your purchasing practices to allow some of these contracts to small and underutilized businesses, women-owned businesses, uh, uh, minority-owned businesses to kind of, uh, you know, as we approach this recovery, right? I mean, government is a, a big procurer of goods and services. How, how, what are you doing as a business practice to uh, allow for some competitive bidding on the part of small and underutilized businesses and minority owned businesses? Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, thank you so much for the question. We're really proud of the growth that we have uh, enjoyed with our targeted group business program. And uh, this year, uh, despite a pandemic, we have increased our um, our contracting with targeted group businesses to $120 million. Last year, we were at $100 million, and that was a huge celebration for us because in 2015, when we reinvigorated the targeted group business program, uh, we were at about $65 million. And so we've come a long way in a short amount of time, and we've done that through really concentrated efforts, uh, both internally and externally. Internally, training every procurement professional within the state of Minnesota so that they understand the importance of procurement with diverse businesses and that they understand the tools available to them in procurement with diverse businesses. We have invoked something called Equity Select so that they are able to directly select the targeted group business, meaning a woman, minority, veteran, uh, economically disadvantaged, or a person with a physical disability. 
um, up to $25,000. We would really love to see that increase through the legislator, legislature up to $50,000 this year because those contracts are so small and it takes us a long time to make in incremental progress at $25,000 a contract. We have another program called Sheltered Markets, which allows us to uh, allow only uh, targeted group businesses to compete uh, when there are at least three targeted group businesses working within a particular commodity. We use that specifically on construction right now, and we would love to see that expand. We've uh, moved into a tier two program, meaning that not only are we working with uh, just our direct contracts, but we're also expanding that to our indirect contracts as well. And so uh, those are a lot of the things that we are doing. We've worked with uh, Hennepin County, Ramsey County, city of uh, Minneapolis, city of St. Paul, so that our impact and the things that we're doing are reaching even further than just the state uh, so that we can see really holistic change across the entire state and all boats are rising uh, through our work. And so we're really proud of the work that we're doing and we're seeing um, fortunately, unfortunately, some of our peer organizations do it even better than us. So we're seeing uh, uh, some of our peers doing $100,000 in equity select or $150,000, which is great for targeted group businesses, but we as a state should uh, increase ours as well so that we can be um, just as uh, uh, effective in, in that space. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Carlson. That's, that's really good news. Uh, and if I can be of any support, uh, please let me know. It's an area that, um, uh, you know, as you mentioned, there is some room for, uh, you're doing a great job, uh, but if there, if there is room for improvement or things that need to change, um, please uh, uh, let us know about those for sure. So thank you. Thank you so much. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good to see you, Commissioner, and talk, talk with you again. Uh, early you. during uh, the COVID um, pandemic, and, and we had working groups uh, discuss, discussing uh, the emergency powers with your administration. Part of that discussion included the ability to for the state to use state dollars to construct new facilities. Uh, with 10 months experience, 11 months experience, uh, is construction still uh, uh, a priority for the administration to include that into the executive powers? If you could, because we ended up not being, uh, not agreeing on that and if mm -hmm. just wanted to circle back on that and that and, and represent Kosnick that issue goes back to when uh, Plenty was governor governor Plenty when they had the bird mm -hmm. um, virus problem and they yeah. needed to construct a lab and they found they were unable to do it uh, commissioner mm -hmm. uh, mr. chair representative yes I believe that that is still something that would be of, of critical importance to us. The ability to do that and, and create parity with other powers that we have for emergency procurement would be um, helpful to us. I think that uh, until the crisis arises, you don't know what type of crisis you might have. And I think that uh, Chair Nelson is exactly right. When we had the bird flu a number of years ago, and we needed to build that laboratory, our hands were tied. We haven't had a situation yet in this pandemic where we actually needed to construct something. We've had to move um, quickly, but we've been able to use existing facilities for most of the things that we've needed. But uh, in the event that we that we did need to construct something, I think that we'd be in quite a predicament. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I guess I, th I think we still have a disagreement on that. And I think the $7 million morgue is probably a good example of why we're hesitant to use state state funds to construct new facilities and to grow the expense and the demand on the administration. As your presentation pointed out, uh, you've got quite a portfolio of properties to maintain and growing um, that demand and expense, uh, especially in the time of limited resources. It just doesn't seem to be uh, where we want to go, but thank you for updating me on that. Thank you. Representative Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioner. Uh, uh, I, my concern was back when the uh, Historic Preservation Office was transferred to your uh, division. How has that merger been going and is that office still operating in the same manner as it was before? Commissioner. Uh, Chair Nelson, Representative Mason, I think that the merger is going extremely well. We're hearing a lot of positive feedback from partners about 
the transition of the SHPO to the Department of Administration. I think our partners are really happy with the um, changes, uh, the level of service that they're receiving, um, the leadership. And so I think that um, if you speak with the partners who are working with the SHPO now, you might hear really positive feedback about the, the transition to the Department of Administration. Who are some of the partners? Represent, Representative Mason, and we've got five more minutes on this, but you have to get to the next presentation. So, and I have one more person with a question. Representative Who are Mason. some of the partners that you're working with? Uh, historical Society, the tribes, uh, of course. I think that uh, there are a number, the, the feds, of course. So I think all of the partners that, that they work with historically have said that the, the transition has been good. Thank you so much. Jason. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. I just wanted to clarify, um, you had mentioned on the morgue that you had secured $4.1 million in federal funding for that. I'm just wondering where that $4.1 million came from. Was that a, an approved use from the COVID relief funds or was this in addition to those funds? Commissioner. Um, Chair Nelson, that is um, representative. That came from a separate appropriation from the federal government. Okay, thank you. Representative Brindley. If not, any more questions? That's, well, then we'll move on. Thank, thank you, Commissioner, for being here and thank you for your budget, your budget presentation. And uh, um, we'll have some long discussions as we go forward. <laughs> okay, um, thank you so much. Thank you. And next we have a presentation from the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, Executive Director Whitworth, uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair Nelson, members of the committee, colleagues and guests. Uh, for the record, my name is Kent Whitworth and I'm the Director and CEO of the Minnesota Historical Society. With me is my colleague, David, Col uh, David Kelleher, who is the Director of, of uh, public policy and governmental relations. Uh, being sensitive to time, we'll get straight to our overview presentation. Uh, you will see in the first slide that we are the oldest educational institution in Minnesota. Uh, to be clear, we are a nonprofit organization that partners closely with the state of Minnesota to provide a, a fairly comprehensive suite of history services for the people of Minnesota. Um, I'd like to say just a little bit about why history matters. Um, just to kind of cut to the chase, um, history has more as much to do with the future as it does the past. And the, and the better understanding we have on the past, the better stewards we can be of the present and of the future. So that's why it matters so much. And there are core functions that we partner with the state to provide for the people of Minnesota. Uh, our mission is simply to use the power of history to transform lives. We transform lives, families, communities, uh, but, but we believe that, that history truly has transformative powers. Our strategic priorities the last several years are outlined on the next slide. And I, I would particularly point out educational relevance. We are intentionally looking at providing context and also trying to connect the present with the past. Uh, I'll also point out that we are in the midst of a strategic planning process and we have reached out to uh, several in the legislature and appreciate the opportunity to engage all of you as we think about strategic directions for MNHS in the future. So I'd like to say just a little bit about how we learn about history. Uh, as we all know, there are, very, there are uh, varying learning styles. And this slide is intended just to show a sampling of offerings uh, that we use to engage Minnesotans of all ages. Uh, you'll see in the top left, uh, a standard more kind of uh, lecture series program. You see the Northern Lights textbook, which is not only a printed textbook, but, but an ebook with lots of digital resources. We have a range of historic sites. I'll say more about that. And Votes for Women currently is an online exhibition. And in March, we will open up uh, a new exhibit at the History Center. Moving right along. So this is just a summary of the various uh, programs and educational offerings. And they range, as we've said, from our historic sites to exhibits across the network, uh, programming aimed for uh, uh, 
early childhood through um, a grade 12 and lifelong learners, libraries. Uh, we also provide technical assistance in a number of grants. I'd like to say a little bit more about Northern Lights. This is a map that shows the school districts across Minnesota that have adopted our sixth grade Minnesota history textbook. Uh, we now have about 90% of sixth graders across Minnesota using this textbook. And I wanna point out that one of the first things we did when the, uh, when the pandemic uh, arrived is we took this uh, online uh, textbook and made it free to everyone. And the responses we received from teachers and students and families was just overwhelming. Uh, but that was one way immediately we felt like we could, could enhance um, uh, distance learning. And so uh, Northern Lights and that sixth grade textbook is a core part of our educational offering. I would say a little bit more about our historic sites network. You see um, the uh, graphic representation of the 26 sites across Minnesota. Um, that, that we manage. And these are educational resources. They are, they are uh, heritage tourism experiences. And a, as a part of these sites, there are 140 plus historic structures for which we are responsible. And uh, we'll say a little bit more about that later. Moving on to the next image. Um, this is sort of our Raiders of the Lost Ark slide. Uh, if you remember that last scene of the first movie, this is really the bowels of the Minnesota History Center. And this is where you see our state archives and other records stored. Notice the forklift used to access those records. You see these statistics to the left of the slide, but that talks about the volume of uh, records that we maintain. And this is a statutory commitment between the state and MNHS. Um, this is not only valuable for educational and research purposes, but a lot of these records also keep business and commerce across the state uh, going. So this is an, an important stewardship uh, responsibility of MNHS. We'll say just a little bit more about the people served. Uh, on, a, on a typical year, and obviously 2020 was not a typical year, uh, we are pleased to have served on site more than a million visitors. Uh, and that includes about 200,000 school students from across the state. And then of course, uh, we've learned an awful lot in the last year about digital engagement, but on, on any given year, more than 500 visits are made to our uh, website. There are deeper dives as well, uh, different ways that people engage uh, uh, in a more sustained manner. Uh, many of you know about our National History Day program for middle high school students. Um, each year, uh, 27,000 students uh, are involved in a year-long experience, a research project and presentation. This truly is an example of the transformative power of history. We have uh, more than 15,000 members right now. Uh, we have seen uh, a drop off of uh, members uh, because our sites have been closed. And that's one of the reasons a lot of people typically join. Uh, so we will need to rebuild membership. And then volunteers are core to our operation. And you see that uh, uh, 2,500 volunteers, 71,000 hours uh, on a regular, on an, in an annual basis. And that's the equivalent of 26 full-time people. So uh, Representative Nash talks about how we try to do more with less. Volunteering, uh, our volunteer program is a perfect example of how we try to maximize um, um, uh, our uh, ability to do as much as possible with limited resources. Say so just a little bit more about COVID. And um, as I mentioned, we've got an extensive site network, which uh, abruptly closed in the middle of March, like everything else. And that led to a dramatic loss in earned income, about $3 million in the last quarter of FY20, and um, well over twice that uh, projected in FY21. We have had to reduce our staff substantially. We've, we've laid off about a third of the staff, and much of that staff will not return. Um, but uh, so we have, we have been tested and we have been harmed by the pandemic like every nonprofit. But I'm also very proud of how the organization has pivoted toward the digital deliver delivery of programs and services, 
Uh, we have gradually reopened some of our sites, particularly Split Rock, Lighthouse, and Jeffers Petroglyphs that both had uh, terrific seasons because of their outdoor experiences. And I want to be clear that even though many of our sites were closed, we continue to provide ongoing maintenance of those facilities. And as I said earlier, we're engaged in a strategic planning effort uh, and uh, we are engaging stakeholders virtually now uh, more aggressively than ever before. So I think that's a place where we have used this unusual time to really double down on strategic planning and, and, and stakeholder engagement. Um, I'll just point out just a couple of other examples. Um, Historic Forestville in the lower right corner is a perfect example is when the site was closed, we were able to finish a, a, a major asset preservation project so that when we do reopen that site, we've got more capacity to deliver programs and services. So I think that's a good example of stewardship. And the next slide says a little bit more about uh, what we've done. This is Oliver Kelly Farm in Elk River. Uh, that site has been closed except for weekends, late summer and through the fall. But very quickly, we decided to develop a victory garden and felt like this was a great way for us to contribute to the food shelf and the local community. I'm thrilled to tell you more than 9,000 pounds of fresh produce were, were donated by our colleagues at uh, Oliver Kelly Farm to the food shelf in Elk River. So just another example of the innovation and creativity of our staff. The, the pivot during the pandemic. And then one other outdoor installation, those of you who are in Minneapolis or have been down at the river may have noticed what we've called history at heart. And we gave a couple of basic prompts and, and had blank little hearts for folks to, to reflect and respond to what they were thinking and feeling. And you see that one slide that I just feel like is so positive. You know, every day that passes is it's another day to turn things around. And so this has been kind of a cathartic experience as well as a, a great way for us to capture for the historical record what people are feeling uh, and, 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 uh, and, and how they want to respond to what we've all faced as a state and as a nation, as a world. The next slide um, just simply captures, it's a quote that captures the inherent tensions in history. And it's a way to reinforce the, the notion that, that we, are, we are managing and, and, and very challenging times uh, with the pandemic, with the social unrest. And this, uh, this quote kind of sets our expectation of helping the people to navigate uh, the tensions uh, of history. We can't make those go away, but we can help people navigate that uh, in, in a way to, to, to build unity and to build empathy. Um, and with that, I'll move away from the mission part and we'll transition into the budget presentation and I'll turn it over to my colleague, David Kelleher. Thank you. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Kelleher. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, I'm David Kelleher, Minnesota Historical Society. And, and taking a look at the clock, I'll, I'll make a very quick pass through our uh, budget overview for the committee. As you can see in this first slide, uh, our state appropriation is approximately $23 million each year from the state's general fund. But if you take a look at the, the pie chart, that makes up a proportion, a very important portion, but a, a a foundation and a base on, on which our operations are built. The Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, uh, ACHF on this pie chart is legacy funds, makes up another significant part of our budget. A significant amount of those funds go out to other organizations in the form of grants, but also the green uh, section, non-state 36%, represents other uh, forms of revenue that come into the organization, earned revenue from historic sites admissions, um, parking fees, copy fees, as well as contributions and memberships. So these three pieces work together to help us present a, a really strong history program to Minnesotans across the state in ways that, as, as Mr. Wentworth presented, uh, reflect different learning styles for learners of all ages across the state. And our overall operating budget in, in FY20 was $57 million for all funds. 
Uh, again, you, you have a copy of the annual report uh, in, in your committee materials, and this is an excerpt from the report. So taking a slightly deeper dive into that pie chart, earned income, which, which Kent mentioned, um, took an abrupt hit when we had to close down historic sites and museums, represents a significant amount in the purple 16% of our overall uh, funding package. How we spend the money uh, in FY20, again, this is also from our annual report um, that we provided to you. You can see the, the relative proportions. We have currently 292 full-time equivalents as of January 1st doing this work. And that's a reduction, as Kent mentioned, from uh, before the pandemic with the closure of a number of our sites. We're working hard to reopen uh, with the History Center back online for limited hours with limited capacity, but getting, getting back into um, operation. And we are doing planning for the summer season to make sure that we can operate in a safe and sustainable way to welcome our visitors, both from the outdoor experiences that, that Kent talked about at places like Split Rock Lighthouse and Jeffers Petroglyphs, to some of the locations that are more intensely indoor experiences. So moving to our what's before you this session, the general fund operating budget, the base budget is $23.5 million from the general fund. And the governor did recommend um, one change item uh, for operating adjustment for compensation and healthcare costs for staff. That is 1.1 million for the biennium, um, broken down 400,000 and 700,000 each year. And, and some additional emerging challenges that we are facing. Um, reopening will present some challenges. We, we need to have the staffing yet at the same time when revenue is not coming in from admissions quite yet. So there's a, there's a timing issue that we need to work through on that front. Uh, we need to continue working on preserving our facilities. Pandemic or not, uh, time takes a toll on those, those structures. And those of you who have been on the committee for a number of years um, have heard us talking uh, over a time about digital preservation and access, making sure that the vast collections that we hold for the people of Minnesota are accessible and, and also preserved so they're not overused when people come to take a look at them. Um, those of you who are tracking the budget books, this slide uh, tracks with the information that's in the budget book. And um, we have three minutes left and we have quite a lot. I Good. Mr. We'll Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm done and uh, we're happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for your time today and your support. And members, we have three minutes left and they, we have to be out, out of here. So I have Clay, our Greenman, Claiborne and New Brindley, uh, Representative Greenman. Mr. Chair, um, and I think that in the interest of time, I will uh, avoid all my nerdy. I was in, I did history day as a kid. I've been a history day volunteer, spent time in the BNSF uh, um, archives. And so I just really appreciate um, the sort of multi-dimensional ways that you, um, that the Historical Society shows up all across the state in all sorts of ways. Uh, my question is in my district, um, uh, uh, Fort Snelling and Padote are in my district. Um, and I know that there's a revitalization uh, plan happening. I can see it. I was actually out there uh, this weekend um, hiking around. Um, I'm wondering how um, in that, how that's going and how, as you're telling stories, we're really telling the layered uh, pieces of the story today is the second day of Black History Month, um, the, the relationship with the indigenous population, how you're building that in uh, to that revitalization. Commissioner. Chair Nelson, Representative Greenman, uh, thank you for asking about the Historic Fort Snelling Revitalization Project. Uh, that project is doing very well. We rescoped that, it's a $34.5 million dollar capital project, um, roughly half from the state and half raised from the private sector. We exceeded private sector goals. The construction goes well. Uh, we are uh, uh, planning to reopen in the spring of 22. Uh, and as you said, we are working to expand the narrative pull there. Uh, you mentioned uh, Black History Month. So the story in particular of Harriet and Dred Scott is central to Fort Snelling. Uh, as are the Buffalo soldiers that were there in the, the late 19th century. Um, we will continue to be committed to the military history, but we'll also be telling the story of Native Americans that are 
millennia before the fort. Um, we'll also be talking about the Japanese American language school there. So it's a fabulous opportunity to continue to talk military history in the context of all of these, these uh, groups. Um, and so uh, we look forward to welcoming everybody out there in the spring of 22 to experience the revitalized work. Uh, Representative Claiborne, I think you're going to get the last question as my clock just turned over to town o'clock. Um, Representative right. Claiborne. Thank you so Sorry, much. Representative. Um, I will just ask my question, and um, this is about the, I've seen the map of all the wonderful spaces that you have all across our great state, and I'm always encouraging the people of Plymouth to do staycations and to go visit all of these wonderful sites. But as we think about that, and uh, since I represent a suburban district, um, I would be interested to know how we help build the economy all around our state through these wonderful historic sites. You know, we have restaurants, we have uh, wonderful opportunities for our families to have these vacations. Would you please talk about how we can use these sites for economic development for the entire state, especially focusing on greater Minnesota? Commissioner, sure, I'll quickly. Yeah. Uh, Chair Nelson, Representative Cleveland, yes, history is good business. And um, this is what we are doing is driving heritage tourism. We've got a great relationship with Explore Minnesota. And so uh, communities uh, look at this uh, at, at historic sites as, as, as core pieces of their tourism uh, offerings to, um, uh, to the public, to school groups. But the bottom line is, uh, Good history is an economic driver across the state of Minnesota from community to community. With that, members, uh, we have our meeting on Thursday. We have bills coming up on Thursday. Um, with that, it's uh, 10 01. We are, um, I'm, we adjourn the meeting for today and thank you for your presentations. And we'll uh, give it the proper rec recommendations or consideration when we go through with our budget. Thank you, members. And thank you, Commissioner. Thank you.